Well, um, in recent times, I've been um, working with and associated with a company treated very royally by them, despite a lack of time, that is replacing hard disks with solid-state chips. And it's a thing that everybody who has a camera is very familiar with, but it's being done on the big scale, the big data centers with hundreds of thousands of servers and hundreds of thousands of hard disks, and we're replacing them very successfully. This company, Fusion IO, has been so successful. It's like being with another big revolutionary hit, you know, like a Cisco and Apple, something like that. And that's not that well known by most people yet, but boy, has it taken over the, uh, the Internet servers. Um, I just grew up, you know, I, I get different characteristics that I say, my father really gave me these and my mother gave me those. And my mother said, always treat life nicely, have a sense of humor, play with things, you know. And, and um, I don't know, something struck me that jokes, I liked laughing. And I thought, I did a lot of internal thinking because I was very shy when I grew up. And I thought, you know, if life's all about happiness, how much are you going to smile versus how much are you going to frown? Let's do a lot of, you know, build a lot of fun into work. So whenever I did work, I always made sure that I had breaks for fun or I could put in a little joke or laugh about it. It's like, you know, putting an Easter egg into a program. A lot of programmers want to do that. And the company's like, no, you can't. But, but it's that kind, of, that kind of little joy. You're almost playing with the system a little bit in a lot of times. But I'm convinced that a little bit of trying to misbehave, go beyond the boundaries that you're supposed to be able to get to, that that leads to creative thinking. Yeah, my connection with others have usually given me the guidance to have a direction, to know if something's right. It's almost like if you, and even though I was very inward as a person, very independent, you hear things everywhere you go. You hear people talking to other people, and it's very effective to hear somebody telling something to somebody else, and you're picking up a cue about the world. I was picking up my senses of, you know, my strings with other people that way, where I was way too shy to actually develop them. I was unsocialized. I was like a common nerd where I knew electronics and talked about electronics with my electronics friends, but the normal people are talking a language that I don't know. I don't know how to make this small talk of the day. Um, I certainly had a lot of good um, input when I was young. I discovered books and magazines. I was a good book reader in school and articles. And when I got interested, when I had an interest in electronics, anything, be it get a ham radio license, my father was an electrical engineer, and he would help me, but he didn't push me. He was there to work with me as a partner. I had, two, I had a brother and a sister, and they didn't turn into engineers. He didn't make us be engineers, but I wanted to do science fair projects involving electronics, and he was there to, but I don't know how this works. He would teach me how a, how a little relay can make a decision, you know, about a, a group of switches, be equivalent to a group of switches. Oh, all right, I can build this project for the atomic structure out of relays. And, you know, and he helped me build long, long projects that took a long time to build. So you, when, when you do that, and when you're in elementary school and you're building projects that take dozens or even hundreds of hours, I mean, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different parts to, for a computer that plays tic-tac-toe, for example, you get the experience in life to work on long projects. And, but the, the main mentor was my dad. Um, later on in school, I was very lucky that te one teacher saw that I was, well, I was too brilliant for his electronics class, and he got me, arranged for me to program computers at a local company. And I went down there, and an engineer would work with me and tell me how to feed them in and all the steps, and I had a programming manual and wrote my first programs, and, um, you know, so it was lucky that, A, a company was willing to allow a young high school student to come in, supervised by an engineer, and use their computer. We didn't have computers in high school. So that was kind of a collaboration of business and, and education that you rarely find. Plus, the teacher was really smart enough to try to get those connections to get students out, outside of school when the school wasn't enough for their own interests. Um, and obviously, you know, we come up through Apple. I wouldn't have done, you know, I worked on project after project after project, and largely it was with Steve Jobs and just my own self wanting to build, seeing a Pong game in a bowling alley, wanting to build one. Steve Jobs getting a job at Atari and then getting us, we got to design breakout. And then Steve and I saw this, this ARPANET, a terminal, talking on the ARPANET. Oh, my God, I have to have it. Well, I, I had no money. Steve had no money. 
when you have no money, no savings account, no rich relatives, nobody could loan you money, I mean, you've got to go home and build it out of parts that are basically free. You've just got to find a way to do it. So, um, so re really, my education, my evolving along technical um, designs was enhanced because I'm just doing it with one close friend, maybe, you know, or somebody to show off to. But in the end, when I have it, I can show it off to the world. And I was collaborating with the world in a sense because that was my motivation. This project I'm working on is me. I've got to make it so special and think of things that other humans wouldn't even think of. I put myself through games because it, and none of it had any dollar value. It was just they were all fun or interesting or you know amazing. And I wanted a computer in my life someday. So the Homebrew Computer Club was the biggest collaboration of all. 500 people talking about how we were going to change society and have instant communication, leave a message, and 100 people could read it off of another computer, you know, over modems. And people were talking about education where you, a, a student gets some questions, types in answers, and then gets told if they're right or wrong instantly. So their mind learns it much quicker than having to come back to school and find out if they're right or wrong. And we're talking about so many incredible things these computers were going to do. It just it grabbed me. I was too shy to raise my hand and talk. But boy, did I listen and pick up this instinct for we're on top of a revolution. And my part was technical skills. Actually, in my book, I was trying to say that my father spoke about technology has good sides and bad sides. You know, you might discover more about the atom and you might create the atomic bomb. You might, you know, so there's, there's ways to look at things. Uh, obviously, in our time frame, computers, they, but they addict the kids to it. But, you know, and, and they have games, and the games are, are distracting the kids into an unreal world, and they aren't learning things they should learn. So everything can be looked at as positives and negatives. So my father said, basically, you know, what is the reason? Why do we want to be engineers? Why are we engineers important? We build things that people need in their homes. And I thought of how oh, the great-grandmothers didn't have a dishwasher. And now we have dishwashers. These modern appliances are what make our life easy and nice, and they had a real hard life. I, you know, I don't look that way, at it that way now, but I did then. And I said, boy, I want to you know, just be one of those people that makes the better things for the home. And I'm thinking the standard Joe and the standard home. You know, I'm not, I'm not thinking, you know, what the military needs to get their rocket in space and that kind of stuff. And I had a little transistor radio. This was just such a beautiful, beautiful technology, and it gave me music to my ear. All night long I could sleep and hear the songs of the day and uh, always wanted to have these little handheld devices that did nice things. And so when I grew up as an engineer, I was still driven by that same drive to make things good in the normal person's home with technology. And that always meant to me... Don't be a theoretical engineer. Be a practical engineer. Build devices that you actually interact with. You tune things, you push buttons, and they do what they're supposed to do. That was so key in my thinking. I knew that all through school, even before I knew that engineers design computers. You know, I, I love designing computers all the time. I get in high school, I could design any computer that existed in almost two days. But I didn't think it would ever be a job. I didn't think there were jobs in computer design. Engineers made televisions and radios and and guidance systems, and but whatever I did had to have interaction. And cell phones, even if it was just dumb phones that just made phone calls, my gosh, used to be in the old days you had a powerful AM radio transmitter, 50,000 watts was the most powerful, and you could hear signals from across the country maybe. But smaller stations were local, and they'd share the same channels and only work in a small area. And cell phones came along. They said small little cells can share the same frequencies and thereby multiply the number of people that can use the phones and be portable. And I was always into portability. It was like anything that made you feel more free was good to me. In my life, get rid of a wire. Anytime you get rid of any wire, even through Apple history, it's just, it's just a freedom that, wonderful, I feel a lot better about it. I don't feel like I'm leashed and constrained. And so the, I got the early big cell phones, you know, and, you know, stage by stage by stage. That was an important part of my life and just amazing how that connected us. You know, now that the whole computer is in such a tiny, tiny little package, I look at it and I'm in awe this day. Right now as we talk, I'm in awe to look at it and think, how much of a computer's in there, and how many sensors, what incredible displays, what incredible input devices, and can even sense, you know, direction like a gyroscope does, um, accelerometers, it's got, uh, you know, motion detectors and, um, and proximity detectors, the whole thing, light detectors. It's all an incredible computer system in such a package, and it's usable. 
and it's useful and it changes my life more than computers did. So I'm even going to say the, the really, and although, you know, these smartphones that did all the internet and the email and the browsing and this kind of stuff existed, really the iPhone is the first one that really changed that world and really said, here is an internet device for the pocket done the right way. It's not overblown in some ways and it's, we really understand how a person needs to use it. Internet obviously is our large source of data, uh, information. If you needed the answer to a question in the past, you asked a very smart person. But now you ask, it starts with a G-O, it's not God, it's Google. You ask Google and you generally get so many different varieties of that information, much better than you can get from one person. Not always, it doesn't always work, but when it does, it's, it's become predominant. So the internet is almost our, our closest friend, our biggest trusted, our future. Our future depends upon information. Our work depends upon information. Talk to somebody doing any kind of engineering that isn't going on the internet, checking out chips, specs, this and that. You do it all that way now. It's because it's so much preferable and so much easier than trying to have a lot of books that were never up to date because they have to go through a huge printing process, lots of atoms moving through on pages of paper to make the book. It can't be updated instantly. Everything on the internet is instantly updated. If there's, if there's corrections that are needed, the corrections are made instantly. Um, much more trustworthy. Now, as for myself, um, I also um, encounter a lot of people. You have questions about things in your life, and people suggest, oh my gosh, you might want to try this program or try this app, or you might want to look into this other product. It does it this way. And you instantly, so um, I used to be very shy. And now, because of the internet, I've just got tons and tons of people that I know closely or I know very distant or I don't even know at all, and they're all giving me you know, good advice, good comments. And the internet, is, the internet is such a huge thing now, especially with things like Facebook. I get way too much email every day to answer them all. I try to read. So what I do is I try to read every one, but so I just have to avoid answering a lot because you only have 24 hours in a day. I can't change the laws of physics. Well, Facebook, I don't know if it's one in every 12 or one in every two people has a Facebook account, but um, I can't be an expert on Facebook exactly. I can't ever use Facebook the way it's intended to be used. And Facebook is today's modern creative person outlet. You know, it used to be you could build your own little devices, but now you're building your web pages. You're establishing those links, your connections to the world. And it's really like the world is based around people and what they're doing and who they know and what those people are doing. And it's a much more interesting type of world than the traditional structured business thinking is. You know, it's a very interesting way to live. But an awful lot of fads come into our life, and it's the big thing. And those fads eventually kind of die out and get replaced by something else. And Facebook, we might be overdoing it. The number of hours that you can be on a day, I don't even use Facebook, and I must be using it four hours a day just to read the people's, the, you know, I have a copy of me to every Facebook to my email, just to read what they have and answer a couple very quickly. Um, it's a horrendous amount of time and effort, and that has to come out of something. You only have 24 hours in the day, like I said, and so what it comes out of is, well, I won't go to a movie, or I won't go to an athletic event, I won't go to a concert. I think concerts are really hurting more than anything else because of the Internet, you know, and, and the social networks and all that. Social networks are basically... Huh, every new friend you meet is free. It's like you got a new gift for free. If, you're, if you have something in common, you start sharing some ideas. That's a gift. I mean, it's kind of like uh, apps, on, apps on iPhones. You know, I take, I take my kid to the arcade, or the, um, I take him to a carnival. 20 bucks to throw ping pong balls into goldfish bowls. 20 bucks to throw darts at balloons and, you know, and da 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 da. You spend 100 bucks. My gosh, you go to, uh, here's a cute little app for two bucks, an app for free. Here's one for one dollar. Here's one for four ninety-nine. And they're just big parts of my life and they're so fun. It's like adult entertainment's cheaper than kid entertainment now. Now, I did have an idea once that we could change the paradigm. The paradigm of school is a teacher talks to a class, and then at a certain point in time, the class takes a test. The presentation is fixed out of the teacher's mouth. The test is a variable. Your grade is a variable. And maybe you could reverse that. What if you had, uh, I, when I taught, I found one person can never fail as a teacher if they care. 
one person, one student. It doesn't matter what class of society they come from, even what brain disruption they have, you can always be successful with one person. So what if a computer were a, were a teacher? John has his, his teacher, Larry has his teacher, Julie has her teacher, Sherry has her teacher, and they're all computers. But they'd have to be a lot more like a human than today's textbook, you know, animated textbook presentations with a little bit of fun built in. They've got to really be something that the kid dies for, like they die for Facebook. But if the computer could take on that much human humanness, and we're getting close, look at how many programs on little iPhones you can just speak into, or Android phones you can speak into, and, and get what you want to done without having to think out exactly how to say your words. They're getting very close to these human robustness category of things. Then all of a sudden a student can go into class and say, I want to get proficiency, A level, in every subject. And the computer will monitor. And every student's going at different paces on different subjects. One is going a little earlier in the year on math, and one's going this. And they're getting years off in, as they progress through school, year by year by year. They might be years off different, but they're with people their same age, wherever they are in the class. And then they come out with all A's. So the grade is fixed, but the presentations were all variable. And that, that's, a, that's a very tough step to get to because where do the teachers go and if anything impacts their jobs, uh, they have unions and stuff like that. And I don't think the unions are always that helpful to the schools. You know, I'm pretty liberal minded, but you know, sometimes it boils down to we'd rather teach 30 kids and get paid more than teach 20 kids well and get paid less. Amount of money. Aside from being an engineer, a part of what I thought out was, well, you want to be known as a good person, a good person takes care of others. Kind of like family thing, kind of like the way Hewlett Packard took care of everyone during the recession when they just gave them some, you know, one day every two weeks off. And I just, I don't know, I care about the people who don't have so much. I don't know why it gets to me. I've never been one of those people. I was so lucky I didn't even have to worry about what am I going to do for a job after I get out of college, you know, I always knew. So, but I, I care about those who don't have what I had, you know, and I try to give and help any time I can. And I, I, I really think it's more, one of the most important things you can do is when it's person to person, you're helping somebody person to person, not you wrote a book and it helped a bunch of people, or you wrote a program that helped a bunch of people, but you actually helped one little kid tie his shoe and let him know that other people in the world are good. And I try to be in that position as much as I can, I don't know why. And I, you know, I, and I really admire others that are that way, and I run into them. Well, let's see. I'm doing a lot of public speaking, different categories and topics. I love meeting different types of people that I'm not normally around. Um, insurance people, jewelry people, beauty salon people. Um, I just, I, I love it. I used to be afraid of people, and now I just like meeting them, talking, finding out what they're about, sharing, sharing stories. I'm very blessed because of Apple and its success and its continued success. People always hold me in some kind of very high esteem, and I was a pure engineer. When we started the company, I wouldn't run the company. I'd only stay in the laboratory, soldering iron, writing code, and a lot of people respect that. So they always are very nice and friendly to me carry a lot of goodwill, and that's very fortunate. It gets me into things like TV shows you could never imagine being on, Dancing with the Stars, I was on Big Bang Theory. Um, just, you know, so I sometimes think, how could I ever be so lucky? But then I might be eating breakfast in an IHOP, and I'm sitting there thinking, not good tasting pancakes and, and, and sausages and whatever, and, and I'm in this nice little building. I'm just so lucky to be here right now. I think that frequently, too, when I'm in small concerts hearing music. Music was an important part of my growing up because in high school they taught us how to listen to songs and try to analyze them like poetry. And there were messages in songs that I never would have caught reading words. I wasn't that much into literature and, and it just stunned me. And I started listening. I got into Bob Dylan in some early years and his words were just so incredible. How could a human being write words like this? And I used a lot of them as little guides in my life. And sometimes when I come across something in life, how do I handle it? Here's my philosophy. I can sometimes relate it to a certain phrase in a song that applies here. And uh, music's been so important. So I could be in a small little club. I love going to the small little um, music bars up in San Francisco where the tiny unknown groups play. And I go there about once a week with my wife. And we just you could just be sitting there. And 
and I'm, I'm not a drinker, but a glass of wine sometimes helps. And it could just be you're just in heaven, the, the, hearing this music that you never, ever, you know, it's not the big, well-known stuff necessarily, but it's just beautiful to the ear.